Hi, my name is Jesse Pruitt. I'm the worship pastor at Calvary, and this is my wife, Valerie Pruitt. And we've been married for 16 years. This is our story. So me and Valerie met when she was in high school, and I was just out of high school. He was the really nice guy, so of course, naturally, I was not interested. Um, and then he went off um, to start his music career, started touring and things like that. Um, and I went off with my life. I was, yeah, just in a band and trying to make a career in music. And I stepped back into church and gave my life back to God and started making changes in my life. During that time, I reached out to Valerie and- I was living in Pittsburgh at the time. Yeah, and she said, hey, I'm gonna be in Phoenix if you wanna meet up. So we met up and uh, then we started dating long distance yep. until uh, we got married. So from the outside, our marriage was looking really good. And in a lot of ways, it really has been great. But there was this other side of secrets that almost destroyed our marriage. So there's a lot from my past that I had been burying and hiding and suppressing. And through that, I had developed um, a pretty deadly addiction. Um, at first it was alcohol and Jesse confronted me on that. Um, and then it became so deep um, that I actually became an addict um, and I was addicted to opioids and um, it threatened to, to destroy my marriage and my life an addict, what they do is they lie, manipulate, and do everything they can do to stay in that survival mode. Basically, it was a big betrayal um, on my part. Yeah, and during that time, I was like, what, what do I do? And so I was seeking counsel of how to, uh, yeah, just really go about redeeming our marriage and getting Valerie help. But I knew that had to be a choice from her. Yes. And so thankfully she chose that and wanted to get help and got a lot of great counseling mm -hmm. and a lot of healing, which in turn drew our whole family closer to Jesus. Yes. So during that time, Valerie had a choice to make because uh, her life was just out of control and it was affecting our whole family. And so we talked about rehab and if she wasn't gonna do rehab, we talked about or not being in the house. Yeah. And that was a really, really hard decision for me um, to stand that ground. Yeah. But I knew that had, had to be what happened. Yeah. And so thankfully she chose to go to rehab. And during that time, as God was working through her, I was still at home taking care of the kids and working and praying with her every day. But I knew God was gonna do something great through that. And he did. Yeah. So. We look back now and at what God's done, not only in her life, but in my life, my kids and our family. Yeah. So what this process did for me and healing our marriage is it reprioritized. So God really truly came first. And by honoring God, I was honoring my husband. I was honoring my children by my choices, by my action, by my words. The more I seek Jesus in my life, um, the more I know I'm doing right by my family. Yeah, and I would just encourage everyone, there is always hope. Yeah. God can heal, He can restore, yes. and He can do great things through that to be able to help other people. So whether if that's celebrate recovery or getting counsel, uh, we know that God can make the changes if you're willing to surrender. And He's yeah. done great things in our marriage, and I know He can for yours as well. Amen. What a, what a great story. I want to thank the, the Pruitts for sharing their story, Jesse and Val. And as we continue uh, just this evening in worship, would you join me in prayer? God, we thank you for this evening. We thank you that, that you have called us to yourself, that you love us and care for us. And, and God, we just thank you for the fact that you redeem us, that you redeem our stories and our situations, and the fact that there is hope on the other side of any darkness and difficulty we're facing. So God, as we look to your word tonight and how you want to shape us and grow us, God, I pray that you just speak clearly into our life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Well, good evening. My name is Robert. I'm the family pastor here at Calvary, and, and tonight we're continuing our, our Created For series. You know, this, this month we've been looking through some various ways, especially regarding our, our marriage and our family areas where God has created us and, and how He has created us to be. And um, each, each week we've shared, you know, a little snippet of a story of, of some of our staff uh, marriages and, and shared some of their um, stories of how God's worked in their life. But we've, we've seen some different areas of how God has created us for each other, the fact that marriage exists for a purpose and it's ordained and created by God, but also seeing how we're created for joy, that marriage should bring joy and intimacy out of that. And last week, Pastor Joe shared how the purpose of our families, uh, if we have kids, is to raise kids who worship and follow Jesus. And out of that message is kind of going to be where we're going to get to tonight, because when we talk about kids and we talk about family, there's a universal truth that exists across all parents. And it doesn't matter what religion or philosophies of life they take, there's a universal truth that applies, and that is if you are a parent, you desire to pass on wisdom and insight to your children. So by show of hands, if you have children, how many of you desire to impart wisdom into the lives of your children? Yeah, now I know who's listening or doesn't have kids. So, you know, this is, this is a universal truth, I feel like. I know for, for my wife and I, we want so badly to communicate wisdom uh, to our children to help them live a life, you know, ultimately better than how we've lived and, and avoiding some of the decisions we've made that negatively affected us. But if you can think back to being on the other side of this conversation of when you were the child in the households, Think about how difficult it was to realize that truth. Think about how difficult it was to see the, the reality that your parents want you to be wise and that everything they do seeks to help and bless you. Um, you know, I heard this uh, joke a while back. It, was, uh, it said, you know, when I was 16, um, I thought my dad was so dull, I didn't understand why we kept him around. And when I was 25, he was so wise, I didn't know how he learned so much in just a few short years. <laughs> And, and if you can think back to that transition from being a teenager to being an adult, you can see the difference in perspective that, that exists there. But, but the reality is that, that as parents, we want to pass on wisdom to our kids. And, and often the way that that is most clearly communicated is through the difficulties of life. You know, when I, when I was a, a kid, I know that the ways I learned best often were when I messed up, when I was dealing with consequences, when I was having those hard conversations. And the reality is that sometimes discipline can be the greatest form of character growth in our life. And it doesn't change as we get older. You know, as adults, sometimes the way that our relationship with God grows the most is through the difficult moments of discipline, of realizing where we've fallen short and how God wants us to develop. And so that's where we're going to get to tonight as we explore kind of how discipline works in our life, in our faith, and we're going to be looking at the book of Hebrews chapter 12. You want to turn there and get uh, situated Hebrews chapter 12. And, and as we unpack this, we're going to see, you know, how God works out discipline in our life, but then also how we're to, to model that uh, as a result. And, and I realize even setting this up, this is not a message where you guys are sitting up straight in your chairs with paper and pen going, oh, I can't wait for this. Because the topic of discipline is a difficult one. It's not one that we get excited about but what we're going to see is that when we respond well to the discipline of the Lord in our life, it blesses us, it helps us develop into the people we are created to be uh, and brings a fruit of righteousness in it. So Hebrews chapter 12, let's take a look at what the writer of Scripture has to say for us. We're going to start down in verse 7 and read through verse 11, and it says this. It says, It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness." For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. 
You know, the, the, the writer of Hebrews doesn't leave a lot to the imagination, doesn't leave a lot of gray area here as he unpacks this. And really, the, the first big idea that we have to see here is that God disciplines His children. And this is, this is blatantly obvious through looking at, at this passage of Scripture that God acts intentionally with discipline and correction and guidance for the benefit of His children. And and this is something that it says is proof that God is actually a good father. The fact that he is a father to us is evidenced by his discipline in our life. Now, we're going to get at kind of how that works and what that looks like, but, but really there's a more important question that we have to be asking ourselves and answering for ourselves in this. If we're talking about God being our heavenly father who loves us and disciplines us as his children, we have to answer the question of are you a child of God? Before we get at how discipline works or anything like that, we really have to answer this question of, are you actually a child of God? And by that, we mean, do you have a life-changing relationship with Jesus? Do you believe that you're a sinner in need of saving? Do you believe that Jesus came and lived a perfect and sinless life, that he died on a cross to save you from your sins, that he rose three days later, and that out of that, you've made a commitment and decision to follow Christ? If that is true, then you are a child of God. Scripture makes this very clear. You look at the the book of John chapter 1. It says, but to all who did receive him, that is Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. See, if, if you accept Jesus, that is, you follow him as your Savior, and you make that decision and give your life to him, then you gain the identity of child of God. First John 3, 1 continues the thought. It says, see what kind of love that the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. So first, examine where you are at with God. If you're not a child of God, if you go, man, I don't know that I've really made that commitment decision. I don't know if I truly am living that out, then know that that is the thing that God wants most from you this evening. The thing that that God wants most from you today is for you to make that decision to say, hey, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to make him my savior. But if you are, understand that when we become children of God, we invite his discipline into our life. We invite him to speak into us and, and, and correct us and guide us so that we can be better children of God. See, if you look back at, at Hebrews um, Back in verse 5, he actually quotes some sections from Proverbs, and, and he says this. He says, Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So the ones that God loves and calls his children are the ones that God disciplines. So with that, a second question, if you are in a place where you say, I know how to answer the the child of God question, second question, do you see and recognize the discipline of God in your life? Because the truth is that if you are a child of God, it says that God is going to discipline you. God is going to work in your life to bring correction, to bring conviction of sin, to create godly character in your life. And if you're at the place where you say, I don't, I don't really have any issues, I don't have any conviction of sin, I'm, I'm A-OK, I have no problems, I have no areas to grow, that's a really dangerous place to be because what that means is you're actively ignoring the voice of God in your life. But on the flip side, we know that if we want to follow Christ, there's change involved. We believe that it's impossible to follow Jesus and stay the same So that means that we need to be growing and developing in our character. So where are those areas of your life that that God's nudging you and calling you to grow in? Because God is going to work to correct, to discipline, to guide you. But, But as we talk about that, the thing we need to hear as well is that God's discipline is for our good. See, when we, when we talk about discipline, you know, even, you know, the writer of Proverbs is, is using the word chastising, that God is going to chastise you. 
there can be a tension there to say, hey, we always talk about how God is loving and merciful and gives us second chances and is full of grace and all of this. And now we're saying that God's disciplining you and it can, we can kind of picture him with like the lightning bolt in the sky for us getting mad at that four-way stop yesterday. And, and we can create this false tension that, that doesn't actually exist there. Because what the writer of Hebrews is wanting us to understand more than that is, yes, God disciplines us, but it's for our good. Look back at verse 10 and 11. He says, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, which we all give an amen to. But it says, later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And I want to kind of pick up four kind of motivations that I think Hebrews is, is showing us about God disciplining our life. And, and the first one is that it's for our good. Ultimately, kind of the big idea is that God's discipline is for our good, for our benefit, for our growth and development as a person. But the second thing we see there is that it exists for our holiness. And, and this, is, this is one we may not immediately catch, but but as followers of Christ, we've been called to holiness, which is us being set apart from the world that doesn't follow Jesus, us living differently and, and being visually and, and different in nature from them. And it's saying that when we're disciplined by God, it's aiding in our holiness for us living more like God and being set apart for his mission. But the third thing it says here is that, that it exists for our peace. And this one maybe may have a little tension in your mind, because when you think of discipline, you don't normally think of peace. You might think of conflict, you might think of tension, you might think of arguments, but you don't think immediately of peace. But Scripture says here that when we receive discipline from God, it exists for our peace. Because when, we, when we're corrected and guided by God, we're, we're pushed and coached into a place where we're living more the life he created us to live. And we do that, we, we find peace in knowing that, hey, this is how I was created to be. This is a place where my life ultimately was created to exist, and there's peace that exists in that. But finally, it says that, that his discipline exists for our righteousness, the final point of this is uh, as God works to discipline and correct us in our life, he does it for our righteousness, for our right and correct living. Now, righteousness is not God's only purpose in our life. Right living doesn't give us to heaven. That is not the end goal is to just live right and do all the right things and check all the right boxes. But on the flip side, if we are children of God, we should look at the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf and go, hey, I want to live as best as I can to honor that sacrifice and what Jesus did for me. So, so God's goal is to build us up, to help us, to bring about good in our life, even through the painful process of discipline, even through the correction and that kind of difficult process of speaking into our life. So with that, are you, are you responding to and being obedient to God's discipline in your life? And maybe even a step further, are you inviting God's discipline in your life and saying, hey, correct me, show me where I've messed up? You know, the writer of Psalms in Psalm 119 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting we should be inviting God to say, hey, God, tell me where I need to grow. Tell me what I need to do so that I can live in that way of everlasting. And see, it, it, what, what can happen so easily is we can think, hey, if I just ignore that discipline, maybe it'll just go away. Like if I just don't, don't ask for the correction, if I just don't think about it or focus on it, it'll all just go away. And, and I see this so often in the area of patience. Because how many of you have ever heard someone say you should never pray for patience? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've been the one to say that. But, but as a pastor, I hear this all the time. I hear people say, oh, you should never pray for patience. And the why behind that is they think, hey, if you pray for patience, God's going to give you more challenging things in life to deal with so that you can grow in the area of patience. And I think if you don't pray for patience, everything will be smooth. You'll never have to wait for a snowbird at a four-way stop. Everything will be amazing. And you'll never have to wait in line at Walmart when they have one check stand open and life will be easy. 
except they forget that patience is listed in the fruit of the Spirit. This, this list of character traits that God is, is intent on teaching and developing in us. And it's not like God's in heaven going, oh, what am I supposed to teach them next? Oh, they haven't, oh, they prayed for patience. I totally forgot about patience. Boom, here's everything. That's not how it works. God's going to teach us the, the character traits that he wants to see us develop in life, whether we ask for it or not. So maybe instead of saying, hey, don't pray for patience, don't pray for endurance, maybe we should flip that and say, hey, God, let me learn that first so that life will get easier. Because God is going to teach us the things that he is intent on teaching us. The difference is if we want to ignore and push against that, he has to escalate his corrective action until the point of pain in our life for us to get it. See, I don't know about you, but, but growing up, I never responded to the gentle nudges of my parents to correct my actions. It always was the more, like, obvious form of correction. And that's exactly how I think God works in our life. He's going to nudge us and tap us on the shoulder and give us that chance to respond. But, but ultimately, He's going to carry out His will in our life, even if that means painful process of discipline. So hear the, the, the good that w God wants to bring into your life. Hear the, the benefit of God's discipline. Hear that God's motivation is not out of anger or frustration with us, not to, to show his power over us as people, but to bless us, to help us, to grow us. Whether we're young or old, whether we're single or married, whether we have kids or not, God's goal is to discipline us for our good. But the thing we have to understand is that, that if we are parents, if we've got kids at home, man, the thing that we have to see is that God is calling us to discipline our children. God's saying, hey, if you are going to live this out, discipline your children. See, when we, we look at the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, therefore be imitators of God as his beloved children. This idea of us being the, the children of God is woven all throughout the storyline of Scripture. And Ephesians says that if you are a child of God, you are to imitate Him. We're to replicate what we see God doing in our life to the world around us. And so we're to take how God treats us as, his, as our Father and, and do that as, as parents as well. And so a, a godly family must have discipline at the, the core of it. Now, let me address something that, that maybe has been a tension point for you up until this point, but if it wasn't, then it definitely is now. Because some of you growing up, you either witnessed or were on the receiving end of, of correction that was unhealthy, that was, that was unregulated, that was ungodly, and really wasn't discipline. And, and you saw discipline carry out in a way that was, was traumatic or painful. And, and hearing this idea of disciplining your kids, if you ha still have kids at home, creates a block for you saying, no, I'm not going to do that. But if we go back to how we defined godly discipline, it says God disciplines us for our good, for our holiness, for our peace, for our righteousness. And those same categories should apply to a parental relationship as well. And so, discipline isn't about showing superiority, it's not about control, it's not about winning the moment or showing who's boss, it's about creating and establishing healthy boundaries and consequences, ultimately, so that our kids will discipline themselves and, and know how to lead their own lives in a healthy way. So, if correction is done by way of violence or intimidation, that's not discipline, it's abuse. If, if correction is based out of anger or frustration of the parent, that's not godly discipline. If the goal of correction is to shame or guilt or tear down the child, that's not godly discipline. And some of you are on the receiving end of some form of that. And what you need to do is call out the fact that you are the recipient of unhealthy, ungodly correction, and that is not what God intended for your family. But instead, you're to see how God has, has established discipline and instead replicate that model to your family. But simply saying, hey, my parents were abusive, my parents were violent, my parents yelled a lot, so I'm never going to discipline my kids. 
is not actually breaking that unhealthy cycle in your family. It's creating a new unhealthy cycle. So understand that the goal of discipline is to raise healthy, life-giving, God-honoring adults. And the truth is that if you have zero discipline in your family, that goal is very hard to obtain. In fact, Proverbs says in verse, or chapter 29, verse 15, it says, To discipline a child produces wisdom, but a mother is disgraced by an undisciplined child. If we want to raise healthy adults, it requires us having discipline in our households. Because at some point, our kids will need to learn the biblical principle of you reap what you sow. And we can teach them that in the confines of our home with our conversations and lessons, or we can let the world teach them that. And the world will teach them that through the, the vigilante social media justices that exist in the world, through those kinds of, of methods, or even through the formal process of, of our correction system. Both are far more damaging and painful to our kids than if we live that out in our household. So, parents, if you have kids at home, here's some, some steps, some things to think about of establishing a healthy process of discipline in your home. I understand I got a, a one and a four-year-old in my house, um, and so we're still trying to figure this out. But um, in the last, uh, I don't know, seven, eight years of doing student ministry, I've seen good and bad and have been able to kind of pick some lessons from other families <laughs> without their knowledge um, to say, hey, here's, here's what I see, and here's how I see that aligning with Scripture as well. But, but here's some, some things. Step one, and, and probably the most important thing is couples, you have to find unity as a couple of what discipline looks like in your household. You have to be on the same page, have unity and agreement with what discipline is going to look like. So you need to decide, you know, what are the, the indicators? What are the things that will initiate discipline? What are the methods of discipline? How long should consequences last? Who will be the one to enact discipline to the kids? All those things should be conversation points and have unity in that. And if there's disagreement, then you need to talk until that disagreement goes away because your kids will pick up on the fact that there is disunity if there's a disagreement, if there's a difference in severity of punishment between the two parents, they'll figure that out and find a way to, to manipulate that. So, so find unity there and also understand that if you are part of a blended household, this is innately more difficult. And I've seen this up close. It is challenging for those of you in blended households to find unity there between the one parent and household and the other. But work through that. Find ways to, to find a middle ground, to find agreement, even if it means maybe finding a compromise that isn't exactly where you want it to be. It's far better to find some, uh, some form of middle ground and unity in that blended household situation than to try and make up for the discipline when they're at your house. So families, find unity. Couples, uh, parents, find unity at that point uh, of discipline and, and have a plan there. Secondly, set and communicate clear boundaries and expectations to your kids. Because picture this, picture for a minute, you, you get a new job. You know what the title is, you know where your office is, you know where the lunchroom is, you know who your boss is and where their office is, you know how to get there and everything like that. But you show up your first day, there's no job description, there's no uh, employee handbook with a set of you know, proper code of conduct, there's no guidelines for what you should be doing, there's no really expectations communicated at all until the day that you find yourself in your boss's office getting corrected for something you did wrong. Now, if you're like me, that would be incredibly frustrating and, and create anger within you. But we have to understand that if we only communicate our expectations and boundaries to our kids after they break them, that's exactly what we're doing to them. And so we need to figure out what are the boundaries, what are the expectations that you have for your kids from age breathing at zero up until they leave the household, what are your expectations for them? And communicate them in advance to your kids, but also communicate this is what will happen if you break those. Because I've seen so many different family situations in households of teenagers, especially where this matters, and, and the teenagers where there's no expectations, there's no discipline, there's no guidelines, there's no rules at all, are the households where those teenagers struggle. 
but the households where there's expectations and guidelines and boundaries for them, the kids are so much more likely to thrive and succeed. So define and articulate what those boundaries and expectations are and then adhere to them. And finally, be consistent in your discipline. See, if you want to create a, a culture of discipline and parenting that, that isn't respected or effective or, or doesn't actually yield fruit in your kids' lives, then all you have to do is be inconsistent with your discipline and not follow through. Because your kids will pay attention if the decision of discipline and correction that you make is similar to the last time they made that mistake or similar to when their sibling made that mistake eight years ago, even though you forgot about it. Your kids will pay attention if it's consistent. Your kids will pay attention if you follow through. See, I think one of the most damaging things, too, is to say, hey, this is all the consequences for your mistakes, and this is how long it's going to last, and then we don't follow through with that. So parents, if, if you're in a place where you're like, hey, you, you've, you're grounded for a week, or you've lost your gaming system or your phone for a week, and you give it back after a day, what are you teaching your kids? You're teaching them that when they make a mistake, it's, it's got some temporary discomfort, but there's no lasting consequences. And if our goal is not just to raise good kids, but to raise great God-honoring adults, how do you think that lesson will affect them long-term? So be consistent with your discipline. Follow through with that. And see, maybe you're here today and you don't have kids at home and, and you're an empty nester and you're just thinking back to how parenting existed for you and maybe even thinking about how you're, you're being a grandparent currently. And maybe in that, you've, you've, this has brought up some, some areas where you feel like you could have done things differently. And, and let me address that for a second because I think when we look at our past and we, we identify mistakes we made, we've got one of two options in that. We can either bury it and pretend it never happened, we never talk about it, we never acknowledge the mistake, and we just try and move on with it. Or we heap on shame and regret and guilt and, and just dwell on the mistake we made. But neither one of them is beneficial to us. Neither one of them benefits our family. Because the truth is we can't change our past, but we can seek to redeem our present and our future for our family. So with that, if you identify that, that your discipline as a parent was unhealthy or abusive or went too far or was dysfunctional, let me challenge you to own that, to just admit where you made a mistake and to apologize to the people that need it. It's going to be awkward. It's going to be painful. And it may not immediately redeem and rectify the relationships, but I can tell you the number of times I've had people sit in my office and say, man, if if my dad, if my mom would just admit what they did and apologize, it would do so much to fix the situation. So invite healing and redemption in your family by owning it and offering an apology. And maybe on the other side, you look at it back at your family and go, man, I wasn't, I wasn't overbearing or abusive, but, but I really didn't have any discipline and I didn't set my kids up for success because I didn't give them any correction at all. Own that as well and have a conversation, and maybe there's some, some enabling that still exists that you need to, to conclude, and maybe you need to offer an apology for saying, hey, I, I didn't set you up for a win, and I'm sorry, and, and how can I help you grow and move forward? Because at the end of the day, we have to understand that in the moment, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. Whether it's the discipline of God in our life, bringing correction of our character and our lifestyle, or it's us enacting discipline to our families, trying to develop healthy kids and, and, and adults that will benefit our communities. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. The scripture says those who are trained by it yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And that's our prayer for you tonight, that, that as you look at your life and how God's working in it, that you would respond to God's discipline and that it would bring about good things that it would help you grow to be more the person that he created you to be, that it would, it would bring about good, it would bring about good, uh, holiness and peace and righteousness, and that in your families you would seek to, to replicate and in, uh, imitate that to your children, and that as you do that, you would find blessing and hope.
Because ultimately, God wants to, to lead us to the place of life, to the place of blessing. And he's going to, to use whatever means necessary to help us do that. So are we going to welcome or are we going to fight against it? Our prayer is that you would welcome that correction and, and invite God to speak into your life. Let's pray. God, we thank you tonight for the fact that, that you sent your son Jesus to, to save and redeem us and call us your children. The, the very reality that we're here talking about how we can see you as our father and, and live as, as your children is, is honoring to us. It, it, it's awe-inspiring that, that we can be called children of God. And, and that shows the love that you have for us. And, and we also recognize that even in those painful moments of correction and discipline, that it's your love shining through that that it's your love wanting to, to make us more into the people we were created to be. So God, help us to, to replicate that to the world around us. Help us to, to, to respond to your love and correction and then live that out to our families as well. God, we want to be more like your son Jesus. So help us to do that. Help us to, to hear and respond to your guidance and love in our life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.